Hey, welcome everybody. Part two here in our Blue Glow 2020 amplifier pre-build series. Uh, this will be the last in the pre-build series. I think following this going forward, it will actually be about the uh, the amplifier we're choosing to build. This is just a little precursor build up to it all. And um, if you haven't watched part one, I would suggest you go back and do that. As you guys probably know, every year or two, I try to do a amplifier build with gory detail. Um, many, many videos in this series, lots to watch, and hopefully a lot to learn. If that's what you're looking for, this is probably the right series for you. If you just want a 10 minute quick high level video on an amplifier design, I'm probably not your guy. So um, having said all that, you know, I've been, I've been away for a few months now on this topic, but I have not been away from the project. I have countless hours at this point in research, design, um, bench testing and building, uh, and refining and I'm finally to a point I know where I'm headed and I know what I'm building a little bit more tweaking to go and you'll hear about that today but um, if this sounds like something you're interested in stay tuned I will give you a tip here you might want to grab a drink and a snack this might be a long video but um, there's a lot I need to cover with you guys and uh, if you're interested in this it'll, it'll be worth the journey so uh, go grab your snack while we dive on in all right, before we get too far out over our skis talking about the specific design we're looking to build, I do think it was worth a few minutes here to walk you guys through um, just the basics of a single-ended triode 300B amplifier and some of the attributes that are typically found in a 300B amplifier and what makes them so special, okay? So let's, uh, let's dive on in. All right, so what you will find on the front end of an amplifier typically is an input, you know, some type of um, variable, pot variable potentiometer here that is used as a volume control. And this whole input stage here in the red box help along with the front end of this tube helps to define the input impedance of an amplifier. One of the attributes you want in a good amplifier if it's tube based is a high input impedance on the front end so it's easy to drive okay um, up next what you will find then is a driver stage and in this case this design and by the way this is the probably the most basic simple 300b design i could find on the internet it probably would work great but it lacks some of the bells and whistles that would make it an absolutely great amplifier it would just be a good amplifier okay but what they're doing here is they're using two halves of a 6S and 7. Remember, that's a dual triode, so you got two triodes inside of one envelope. So basically two tubes. You're using one here to do some amplification, and then you're feeding the signal out of it into the next one to do more amplification, okay? And then you're feeding out of it to then drive into the 300B. So what we end up calling this is our driver stage which ultimately feeds then into our output stage here, which is made up of both the output tube as well as the output transformer here, okay? And the, the 300B has some attributes, and one of those is a, a an, something called Miller capacitance. So even a vacuum tube that is not a capacitor has elements in it. As you can see here, the grid and the plate are in parallel with each other, actually in parallel with the cathode as well and anytime you put metal plates in parallel with each other you end up with capacitance and this default capacitance just from having these metal plates near each other is called Miller capacitance 300b has a fairly high Miller capacitance which makes it hard to drive okay so you got to have a pretty good bit of voltage going in here and typically you want a low output impedance um, stage here in front of this trying to to help overcome this Miller capacitance here you know in the output um, while we're looking at this if you'll notice here the output tube is what is called a DHT or directly heated cathode tube okay in other words the little metal filament inside of the tube here that is it serves two purposes one it is the cathode of this tube and two, it is also 
the filament that heats up the tube. So those are both happening on the same piece of metal there inside of this, and that called, that's a DHT. When you have, like in the 6S and 7, it is a non-directly heated um, triode in that the, the filament here is separate from the cathode, and it uses a separate set of pins to heat up the filament. Here, the same pins we're feeding to heat up the filament are also the same pins we're feeding off of for the cathode. Um, so that creates a little bit of trickery that we have to deal with as it comes to, um, you know, a uh, single-ended triode using directly heated triodes. Okay, next up, um, you typically want some high-quality iron right here. And we can, we'll get into a little more why, but I'll tell you this. Um, you want to have as little loss in this output circuit as you possibly can. Um, because we're not dealing with a ton of output power right here. So we want the mass, you know, the vast majority of it to end up on the output here. All right, which finally leads us to this last box here, which is our power supply, okay? And I cannot stress how important the power supply is in a SET amplifier um, using directly heated cathode tubes. Um, we get, we'll get into it a little bit more later and I'll show you why, but uh, just trust me, if you'll follow along this lead right here, the B plus that feeds up into the anode or plate of the 300 B, guess what it goes right through? It goes right through the output transformer. So if you've got ripple here on your power supply, it's going to feed right in here into your output transformer. It's going to get transduced across and it's going to come right out through your speaker leads. Additionally, if you look here at the winding on this power supply that is designed to feed the filaments of this 300B, right? Well, they're also <laughs> tied directly into the cathode of this 300B. So um, super important. This power supply, you can see transformer primary plugging into the wall with a switch and a fuse. It's got multiple secondaries, 6.3 volts to feed the filaments here, the 6S and 7. It's got a 5 volt filament here to feed the 300B. It has a 800 volt um, that is center tap, so 400, 0, 400 that feed the cathodes here of this, I'm sorry, the anodes here of this 5U4. Um, which then you're actually feeding then the cathode here, which is another direct heated cathode. You're feeding it with another 5 volt winding and you're pulling the B plus off, bringing it over here through what is considered a CLC filtering system, a capacitor, a choke or L for inductor and another capacitor, which then ultimately feeds up into this uh, amplifier. So Having said all that, again, this power supply is very important in a 300B or any single-ended triode uh, amplifier design. All right, let's talk a little bit about the amplification that's taking place in a basic 300B design. And just keep in mind, I use just some numbers here to play around with. These are probably not 100% accurate, but they're directionally correct. And it would depend on the amplifier and the design and the design of each stage and how they're biased at the end of the day. But, but typically you've got somewhere around a half a volt feeding in here, which is line level. Okay, it would come through this potentiometer. You'd send some of that into this 6S and 7. Probably not all, because if you send it all, you're at full volume, okay? Um, you'd feed some element of that in here, but let's just pretend we did send it all through. Um, half a volt here. If we go look at the data sheet for a 6S and 7, its amplification factor or mu is 20. Okay, so a half a volt times 20 is equal to 10 volts. So going into this half of the 6S and 7, we've got a 10 volt swinging signal going into it. Guess what? We're going to multiply it again because we're feeding it into yet another. Um, stage here of gain. And if you'll notice, we're coming out the other side with something like 200 volts feeding into the 300B. Now, in reality, that might turn out to be 160 volts peak to peak. It might be 180. It might be 200, but it, I can tell you in this design, it can't be much more than 200 because there's only 210 volts sitting here on the plate to swing. Um, but then ultimately, we're feeding into the 300B, and depending on how you bias it and set it up, 
it has an amplification factor of mu of 3.9. So at the most, it would be 200 times 3.9, but we're not even feeding in that much voltage into the 300B, so it's not biased um, for the full amplification. We're probably getting something out here on the other side of this in the neighborhood of maybe four, 450 volts. Um, and keep in mind, um, vacuum tubes are voltage amplifying devices um, where typically transistors are current amplifying devices. And so when you end up with a lot of voltage right here, you can't feed 450 volts right into your speakers. So you use an output transformer to kind of transduce that signal. So we're sending the AC signal back through this and we're, we are then converting it over here to a low voltage, higher current. So the current can drive these speakers on the output. And typically you'll see somewhere around 3K, maybe 3.5K um, primary being used here. And then you'll typically see 8 ohm, 16 ohm, 4 ohm, that type thing on the other side here. Okay, I can't count the number of hours I spent over the past six months sitting on the couch at night with my wife, either with an iPad or a laptop researching 300B de amplifier design, single-ended 300B amplifier designs. Um, if it exists on the internet, I think I read about it, researched it, studied the schematic, and um, did basically did my homework on it and uh, learned everything I could about them. Um, so, you know, I look, these are all the ones I looked at, okay? And, um, you know, here's what you'll find. So if you look at a car, right, let's take the basic attributes of a car. Car has four wheels, car has a metal body and a chassis, car has seats in it, car probably has windshields, probably car, car probably have, has headlights, an engine, a transmission, and off you go, okay? Well, I just described to you a car that could be a Ferrari. It could have also been a Toyota Camry, right? So what's the difference then between a Ferrari and a Toyota Camry? Well, it's not the basic components. It's the nuances. It's the little tricks. Maybe it's the components that are used. It's the design itself. But at the end of the day, you get in a Ferrari, you push the gas pedal, it goes forward the same as a Toyota Camry. And so if you go back to the 300B design I walked you through a minute ago, it and all of these other amplifiers have a whole lot in design in, in common. And if you look at it, the input, a driver stage, right? The output tube, an output transformer, a good solid power supply. All of these have these those attributes. They just use different components, different design tricks, different little nuances to achieve maybe a different sound, or maybe a different outcome from each other, okay? So the one I spent the most time on was the Classic Western Electric 91A. It's been around since, you know, the 1940s. It is such a iconic classic design. Um, and I will tell you that about two thirds of the amplifiers on this page are either clones of the Western Electric 91A, they are a tribute to the 91A, or they take attributes from the 91A in some way, shape, or form, okay? Um, you know, there's a few on here I'll just point out of, of real interest to me. You know, um, I've got a classic Audio Note um, 300B amplifier myself. I really like the design, but they're making this thing today. I don't want to jump into someone's space and publish schematics and how to build something that's being produced by a company today. I just don't think that's fair. This one's a great one. And if you get a chance, and I'm going to give you a link to this, it's worth you reading. It is called Yet Another Western Electric 91B 300B Amplifier by Thornson, which ultimately became the design behind the Lady Day 91A. And I'll also point out Joe Roberts' sound practices. Um, it's an article Joe wrote back in 1992. Absolute, absolute must read. And I'll, we'll talk more about that later. All of these others are great amplifiers. All of them have great attributes to them. Um, at any rate, we studied them all. 
All right, it's time for the big ta-da. All right, we are headed down the path of the Western Electric 91A Tribute. And I'm being very specific about the word tribute here. It is not a copy. It is not a clone, okay? By the way, this code name right now for this project is Archon 91T for tribute. And I tried to describe the spirit of it here. It is a modernized tribute to the Western Electric 91A that meets today's audiophile demands and uses currently available components while maintaining as much of the spirit of the original design and sound as possible. I can't even begin to tell you how important uses currently available components is to this design. And you will see why here in just a little bit that is such a vital piece of this statement. So that is, that is this is kind of my mantra for this build here. And, um, and down here at the bottom I put, and most of all, I'm hoping we all learn something because I know I have. And, um, and I hope we have some fun along the way. Otherwise, this isn't worth doing. So let's dive on in and talk a little bit more then about the original Western Electric 91A circuit. All right, let's take a look at the original 91A or B circuit here. It used two 310A tubes on the input. These are pentode tubes. And the first one was here, and it fed over into the second one here. And then that fed out of that into the 300B, which fed the output transformer. Doesn't it look a lot like that picture I showed you a while ago? And then all the rest of this is power supply. <laughs> so we, we have already talked. We, you, there again, a car is a car, okay? So a couple things about this that are a little bit unique though, it uses an input transformer right here. Why? Because back in the day, this, this amplifier was designed to feed off of a photoelectric strip inside of a movie projector. So they were getting the audio off of a movie and amplifying it for sound for a movie theater system. So it used a little bit of a step up uh, transformer here for the voltage for that. It used some feedback from the 300B all the way back and you can see it here at the very top it comes out of the 300b feeds all the way back here into the very first 310a so it used some feedback and this this would be not called local feedback but this would be called global feedback because it's not just happening here in the local little circuit it's jumping across all the way back to the beginning of the amplifier it used a fairly complex power supply if you'll notice, there's a lot of caps here in this and, and resistors in this supply. You know, back in the day, high value caps of good quality really didn't exist. You couldn't go buy a 200 microfarad at 450 or 470 microfarad at 450 volts. If you did, it would be the size of a car, okay? Um, capacitance back in the day, they were big and these high values just didn't exist. Western Electric here, the, um, the 171 output transformer here, it's known for being super high quality, okay? This thing has 92 dB of gain, okay? So if you do the math, you look up the pentode and go through and do what we did earlier here on the 310A, this thing multiplies by 40,000. It, it was originally designed to pick up really small signals here, like I mentioned, and we don't need all that. Uh, matter of fact, most of the clones you see out there today, they drop out the first nine, um, 310A tube altogether, and they feed straight into the second tube here, and then just use this, this pentode driving the 300B as the complete amplifier. And there's a few more tricks to this thing as well. And just like everything in life, it is a balance. With good comes some bad, okay? There's a couple things about the 91A that make it a challenge. So let's say you were digging through an old movie theater that was being demolished and you found a Western Electric 91A hidden over in the wall or something, okay? And you brought it home. Um, one, you got two choices. Do I try to restore this and use it and listen to it or do I put it on eBay and make a fortune? <laughs> Because a single 91A these days, well, let me just say this, a pair of them, if you could find a set, will run you in the six-figure range. So it's $100,000 plus for a pair of these. Um, at any rate, so, but 
you would not be able to easily get this amplifier running for you. And, and you might say, well, why not? It's an amplifier. Why couldn't I just, you know, rig it up? Well, here's some challenges, okay? If you look feeding off of the um, 274 to rectifier tube here is your B plus line. The B plus line feeds down and it starts going through some capacitors and resistor circuit. But before it gets over here into the next part of the power supply, it jumps out through this J2 output jumper here and it goes over into the speaker and it goes through the field winding of the speaker and comes back in. And this is an older field monitor style um, speaker that has a field winding in it. And that field winding is being used as the choke in the power supply here. So without, your, without an old matching Western Electric field monitor speaker, you don't even have a, a complete connection for your B plus here. Um, so you would have to um, open the amplifier up and insert inside of it a, um, a choke of some type here to make up for that because there is no filter choke inside of the amplifier. You know, it also, you know, a couple other shortcomings, low value capacitors I talked about. So, so Western Electric had to do a lot of tricks and use a lot of smaller capacitors to make up for the fact that you can't get bigger capacitors. And then probably the most important one here is the, um, the bandwidth of audio sources back in the day, they were kind of limited. And this is a relative statement I'm making, but somewhere around 100 hertz up to about eight kilohertz, right? It was designed for vocals, people talking, okay? It wasn't designed for hi-fi, okay? You know, typically when we're talking hi-fi, we're talking 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and this stops at eight kilohertz. So you can't even hear the cymbal crash coming through one of these amplifiers. And the, the amplifiers were designed around these input sources, and because of that, these are not wide bandwidth amplifiers and they need to be modified to be so. Okay, so what is so special about this circuit that makes a pair of these worth $100,000? You know, there, there's, there's certainly the collector aspect, but the collector aspect didn't come because these were cruddy amplifiers. The collector aspect came because these were amazing amplifiers. It's some tricks, and I'm sure Western Electric didn't call these tricks back in the day. I'm sure they called them <laughs> um, proprietary design um, aspects, otherwise known as their competitive advantage back in the day. Um, but there's some of these tricks. It's interesting. They existed on some of these amplifiers from the 20s and 30s, and then they got lost for years. And then somewhere back in, in the 90s, people started finding these little tricks that people were doing 60, 80 years ago and started redeploying them in modern amplifiers, okay? So the first trick we're going to talk about, and it shows up in various flavors. They're not all identical, but they're generally the same. One is called the Western Electric Cathode Bypass trick, the optimized Western Electric Cathode Bypass. That may have been what Western Electric called it. There's also this Akaido Mojo, you'll hear it called. Sometimes you'll call it here the Parafeed Load trick. But the short and narrow of it is what you're doing is you're taking a tap off of the B plus up here on the other side of the output transformer and you're feeding it down through a capacitor into the cathode of the 300B. So in most amplifier designs, you don't see a connection from here to here with a capacitor, okay? And what this does is it, along with the cathode bypass cap here, um, provides some ripple rejection here on the B+. Plus. Keep in mind, if you've got B plus coming from your power supply into right here, remember we talked about we don't want that feeding through the output transformer into the 300B, because if it goes through the output transformer, it comes out on your speakers. So this capacitor here is designed to take some of that ripple away use between it and the cathode bypass cap here and take it to ground. And what it ends up doing is it cancels out power supply noise and modulation by about 20 dB of suppression, okay? 
And what it's ultimately doing is increasing the PSRR, otherwise known as the power supply ripple rejection. Okay. Um, and the quick little math on this you do, the capacitor must be equal to the cathode resistor's bypass capacitor value. So in a traditional design, you might see something like a 47 microfarad capacitor. And then you divide it by the triodes amplification factor, otherwise known as mu. 300 B's mu is 3.9. So 47 microfarad divided by 3.9. You end up with a capacitor here that would need to be used of 12 microfarad right here. Well, why do you see two capacitors in parallel right here on my schematic? Well, you see that because it's about impossible to buy a 12 microfarad capacitor. But what you can buy is a 10 microfarad capacitor and a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. And if you put those two in parallel, you end up with 12.2 microfarads, which is close enough because this thing here is probably a 10% device and it's probably 4.8 microfarads anyway. All right. And what it ultimately ends up giving you is cleaner sound with improvements to your overall perceived dynamics of the amplifier. All right, the next little trick that the 91A design used is something called the grid cathode trick, okay? And what it is, it's a capacitor between the cathode here. So typically in a 300B or any single-ended triode, you would have your filament and your cathode feeding down through, sometimes this is a hum pot, it's called. You feed it down through a cathode resistor that is bypassed um, and takes it to ground here, but you don't typically see this capacitor feeding over here going to the grid leak resistor that is broken up into two grid leak resistors here. Um, and this is the little trick that Western Electric came up with they called the grid cathode trick. I'm going to give you some homework assignments to read that's going to give you a lot more info. I could make a 30 or 40 minute video alone on this one topic right here. So I'll let you read on it and we'll talk more about it later. This is to compensate, really, um, the low frequency response caused by, back in the day, they, they didn't have big bypass caps. They didn't have 47 microfarad capacitors here. Instead, they, they had 10 or 16 microfarad, maybe 8 microfarad capacitors. So this was to help offset some of that. Now, you may say, well, if you have 47 microfarad capacitors here today, why would you still do this trick? And I'll tell you that there are many purists that believe that this trick adds to the overall low frequency response of the amplifier. And um, Lithenthal Engineering is actually, if you, if you follow their page, and I'll give you a link to that later, they've actually got some pretty up-to-date um, um, lab testing they're doing on this. Um, so stay tuned if you're reading their thread, and I'll, I'll give you a link to that. But even, even if you roll way back to some early, early Western Electric amplifier designs, they were using this trick here um, as it relates to... Um, you can even see they had multiple different places you could tap off of here to help select some of the, uh, the, the bandwidth here on the output stage. So this is not necessarily a trick of Western Electric, um, you know, that was originally part of the 91A. But you remember a while ago I talked about the 91A had some bandwidth limitations because it really wasn't designed, uh, the design as a whole, to handle high fidelity. It, it kind of capped out around 8 kilohertz on the high end of the audio spectrum. And we want this amplifier to at least cover 20 kilohertz, potentially more. Well, um, if, if you go back to one of those designs earlier, I talked about um, Thornson. He had done a little trick here where basically he's taking off of the 300B's plate here before going in to the output transformer. And he is feeding back through a very small value capacitor here um, some positive feedback, some high frequency positive feedback into the screen grid of the 300A. And what this ultimately did was open up the bandwidth of this whole system and defeat the H off high frequency roll off that was inherent to the original 91A design. 
And keep in mind, like I mentioned here, the original was designed to around 8K or so. So this little trick here, and it's just some, I mean, it's not magic. It's just some positive feedback, but handled in a very specific way, very gently, <laughs> uh, to not upset the apple cart. Because anytime you play with positive feedback, you can get into a runaway or oscillation type situation. But he did this in a very smart way, and it helped get rid of this, you know, this roll off that it, that started around 8K. And so um, we will likely be deploying a very similar trick in our unit or our design. So I may borrow some of this from others <laughs> um, to help overcome the limitations of the original design, but yet try to keep the spirit of that original design intact. All right, so where I'm at at this point is, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of bench testing over here, and I have gotten the amplifier stages, the, the, the input, the driver, the amplifier, the output stage, kind of the, the feedback circuits, and these, these little tricks that I wanted to, elements of those I wanted to deploy. I've got all that figured out, okay? And, I, and you saw pieces of that in the schematics I was showing a minute ago. Are bits and pieces of it. I'm not ready to reveal the um, the old schematic, nor or less the uh, the values of that. That'll that'll come as we actually get into the build series. But um, where I'm where I'm at right now, and what I've got ahead of me, um, I am working on the power supply design right now. Um, I've been playing around with similarly about as many power supply designs as I looked at amplifier designs. Um, you know, here's the key attributes we've got to have. We've got to have five volts at two amps um, to feed the um, the rectifier tube. We've got to have 10 volts at 640 milliamps. In other words, 320 milliamps per 310A. And we're going to build a stereo amplifier. So we've, we've got two 310As there. We've got to have five volts at 2.4 amps, um, 1.2 amp per 300B tube for the filaments. And we've got to have a, a B plus uh, winding that gives us 400, 0, 400, in other words, 800 volt. Uh, cross it at 200 milliamps and 100 milliamp per tube for a B plus. You don't need quite that much, but um, on it. But I like to have a little headroom there. And I can't stress it enough. And a single ended amplifier. I mentioned this earlier. The power supply is in the signal path. It is in the signal path. Getting it right is imperative, more so than in a in a any other type of amplifier design. Um, and some upcoming homework assignments will help you understand that a little better. So let's talk about why this power supply is so dang important. Okay, well, I've already mentioned it's you know it's part of the uh, <laughs> the amplifier circuit itself as well, um, but. If you take a look over here on the left, you just got a classic set of JBL L100s. You remember the the Memorex videos from, I mean, the commercials from the 80s. Um, but here's the deal. Those, those speakers are not that efficient. Probably 87, 89 dB, something like that. You're driving them with a 100 to 300 watt amplifier. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of power involved and the, the speakers are not that efficient. But when you start talking about building a single-ended triode amplifier, these are not the speakers that you want, okay? What you want are some speakers over here, maybe some tannoys, maybe some clips, uh, I put some bells, some K-horns, a La Scala, a uh, set of KG-4s, maybe some type of uh, folded horn design or something here. There's a lot of different speakers that are designed to have ext be extremely efficient, maybe 96 dB, maybe 101 dB. Like in my off office here, I run a set of Cornwalls. I think they're 106 dB. Um, that means they, they the, the slightest little noise they amplify really loud. It doesn't take a lot. So the teeniest amount of hum you will hear. If your power supply has this little bit of ripple on it, like I'm showing down here, these speakers will amplify that, or a better word I might use is reproduce that very loudly. And you can't have that. So what's the outcome of that? Well, people get into a lot of complex power supply designs 
when it comes to a 300B single-ended triode amplifier. This is a picture of the kind of Lady Day design. Um, you can see here fairly good bit of complexity here. Um, doing some rectification here on the um, for the um, 310As. Or no, actually the 300B's filament here. But if you'll notice here, wow, while I would like to use this design, um, it's not that practical. Here's why. they had, When they were building these, they had some custom, um, what are known as CMC chokes made, common mode rejection um, chokes here, right? And so that's not just something you can go buy off the shelf um, and use. So there again, you know, scratch this design uh, because that's going to be a tough part to come by unless you want to go get somebody to custom wind you a bunch of them, okay? This is a uh, you know, classic Dennis, Dennis Had Audio Electronics Supply um, SE1 here. You can see there's a lot of components here. You know, there, there, there's some, rec, you know, some brick rectifiers going on here. Uh, a lot of small signal diodes going on here. A lot of parallel capacitance to the primary capacitance here. There's a lot going on um, in this, in this uh, power supply. Similarly here, you know, while this one, this uh, Raga looks pretty simple, okay, it's not. Look at, take a look at it. You've got two chokes involved in this power supply, both five Henry with different resistance windings in the um, in the chokes themselves. So there again, you're going to have to go get some custom wound um, chokes made if you're going to follow this design. Look, they're also. You got your electrolytics. You're also bypassing them with some poly caps here, uh, similar to the the techniques Dennis Head was using. Okay, so while it looks simple, mm, that's going to make this one hard to, to follow. Okay. Similarly here, the, the Jack Music. Okay, look at this. I mean, you got complete rectified power supplies here for heater for left channel, heater for right channel, heaters for the success in sevens. Then you've got look again um you got a, a a common mode rejection uh choke here in this design so you know they're just complex power supply designs and and even on top of that people get into using basic power supply designs but then trying to regulate the heater or filament voltages going to the 300b in a super quiet way and it's it's complex i'll tell you I don't know if you noticed this or not, but feeding this filament right here, you're also, what are you tied into? You're in the cathode circuit of this tube. So whatever power supply you would use to feed these filaments becomes part of your cathode circuit, which becomes part of the amplifier circuit, right? So people do all kinds of tricks. Um, there's a whole thread out on a uh, British thread out there on uh, Andrew's voltage control current source to feed the filaments of this. Uh, Tom Christensen, his neurochrome uh, filament regulator. Tent Labs has some directly heated um, supplies for this. There's the Coleman um, filament regulator. Uh, there's all these things to explore, and I have not yet landed where I'm going to be yet on my. I have landed on the power supply design, I have not landed on my filament. Um, supply design yet so still working on that so stay tuned when we come back around we'll have that figured out and we'll be ready to start building this thing so when I set out to do this design and and you know typically my my builds are they're not something I've started from scratch with nothing right I'm usually I'm usually big borrow instilling elements of other designs I'm putting them together I'm testing to see what works well what doesn't and I'm, and I'm doing that with modern components that you can go buy off the shelf today and build, okay? Um, I expected this. I expected this long and winding road, you know, to kind of tribute a Beatles song here. But typical to 2020, guess what? This is what I got, okay? It has been one heck of a winding road with a lot of twists and turns. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking to you about that. 
So the first thing I ran into as I got down the path of this build was what I will call a nightmare on Transformer Street. <laughs> okay, so I got my design done. <clears throat> I got the, um, the build mostly together. I breadboarded it and built it on the bench. Everything with the exception of the filament supply, which is just some tweaking I'm doing at this point. I have this thing done, okay? So, you know, I reached out to a friend of mine and said, hey, could you help me design some chassis um, for this thing? He did all the CAD work. We got the chassis drawn up. We picked the transformers for it. Got everything ready to go. Um, and lo and behold, then I started to place orders for transformers, okay? And this is what I got back, okay? So what I was using was originally some transcender output transformers was in my design. And then I was going to use a classic tone slash magnetic components um, power transformer because the, the price of their power transformers was was good okay and it's what I used in the uh, 807 build that I did well this is the email I got back hey Mark due to rising cost a major business sales decline in the last four years COVID and a major supply chain issue with our transformer hardware supplier we are in the process of closing our business for good just in case we checked and we do not have the inbuilt colors covers in stock to complete more parts, we're unable to accept your order. Well, guess what that did? It took me back to my chassis design. <laughs> because the power transformer I built my chassis around, I can't get. Okay? So, what do I do? Well, I, th I thought, that'll be simple. I'll just take the specs for the transformer I was going to buy from... Classic tone, and I sent it to Trans. I sent it to Transcender. I sent it to Edcore. And these are <laughs> this is what I started running into. Hi, Mark. Sorry, this is not a transformer we could do. We don't carry the metal that it would take to do it. I started running into other people couldn't, or it was cost prohibitive to build lay down style transformers that look like this for my power transformer <laughs> um, for my chassis. So crud, you know, I, I got to go back and revisit not only my amplifier design now, I got to revisit the chassis design that was completely done. Okay. Um, and I, and I want to say a huge thank you to Larry, the guy that's been doing my design work. He and I have gone through so many iterations. I'm surprised he hasn't drove to North Carolina and strangled me. But he has been one heck of a trooper, and I can't even say how many thanks I owe to him for the uh, iterations he's gone through with me. any rate, this is where I'm at right now. Um, so I am, I'm waiting on a set of these. Um, you know, ISO was previously Tango. Uh, which were some historically well-known and famous um, transformers. And so I'm thinking this is the route I'm going to go. They're not as inexpensive as the Transcenders. Um, they're certainly not as cheap as Edcore. They're certainly um, not as inexpensive as that classic tone transformer. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to build a 91A tribute amplifier here and it's worthy of the good iron now not everyone has to follow this path but i'm going to create a a a trail that people can follow and go down this path and, and i'll tell you more about that here in a second all right based on all the feedback that i got from the first video where i asked for your opinions on some things i have decided to go with uh, chassis in a silver metallic classic western electric look color and I think I'll also make a more limited run of dark blue metallic chassis okay so the goal here is basically to do this I'm going to have some chassis made up okay and I'm going to try to make two variations one of them it's going to have all the holes drilled and ready to go you will be tied to the transformers that I select which is likely going to be um, these um, ISO otherwise known as Tango transformers okay um, 
All the holes will be ready to go. You'll be able to drop them in. You'll be able to bolt the tube sockets in. Basically, I'm providing you the ability to buy a chassis from me that's, that's ready to go. And then you can follow the video. You'll have to order all your parts. I'm not going to sell the parts. I'm not selling a kit. And I'm not providing tech support on a kit. You can follow my videos. I'll probably create a forum out on um, our Audio Karma for the build. If you've got questions, you can go on that thread and post questions and other people can help answer or I'll, I'll follow that thread and try to answer questions myself. That'll be the tech support you get. Um, which leaves you with lots of options. You can buy different brands of resistors, different brand capacitors. You can, you know, you can, you can vary off the build your, yourself there. I also um, plan to make a set of chassis that have all the holes in the back. So if you kind of take a look at the back side here, all ready to go um, to put all these, you know, your IEC socket, uh, RCA jacks, things of that nature in. Um, but the tops will be solid. So at that point, you can punch and drill whatever, um, wherever you want your tube sockets. You can punch and drill whichever transformer holes you want to match up with your transformers. And, um, you know, it's a little more DIY, but at least you got the solid chassis. At least you've got the, uh, the whole, all the holes in the back already done for you. More of an, a universal chassis. But both will be nicely made, heavy-duty aluminum, aluminum chassis with bottom plate, rubber feet, and all will be powder-coated and ready to go. All right, I'm getting close to 50 minutes on this video, so I'm going to start winding it down here, just a few more pages. Um, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. So if you're interested in doing this build with us, um, I think these articles are worth you reading, and I'll put all the links down below in this video. I think reading the Joe Roberts Sound Practices article, and if you, you know, if maybe you're not a pro yet, um, I would say read this article a few times till things start to sink in with you. I would check out the the Western Electric 32A and 91AB sections of the uh, Lilenthal Engineering site. Covers the parafeed and grid to cathode coupling tricks that I talked about earlier. So you'll kind of get a much better explanation than what I went into. Um, you can read a little more on the 32A trickery. By the way, I don't know if you guys remember, I made a video a year or two ago where I bought a 32A, which is a, like an extremely rare amplifier. I'm, um, matter of fact, you can't even really find pictures of it on the internet. Um, but anyway, it was, it was a, an amplifier made many, many years ago. I, I made a video saying, hey, I found one, I bought it, and I'm looking for more info on it. Um, believe it or not, I didn't find a lot more. Other than there's a, a good, there's some good info here on Lilenthal's site and this uh, uh, nutshellhifi.com uh, site. But both of those cover the parafeed, parafeed and grid to cathode tricks. Um, there's some really good articles. These get a little, a little deeper technically wise on John Broski's, um, you know, TubeCAD guy. Um, on his site, and he's got one on single-ended power amplifier design, and it, it gets into a lot of what, what makes these things special. Is it art? Is it science? Is it some of both? It is a really good read, and, and I've, read, I've read that article probably six or seven times in my life. It's, it's really good. Um, as well as uh, John's got another article out there on this kind of a, a kido, kid, I don't know if that's Akito or Akadio, uh single-ended ops, but it talks more about the uh, the mojo um, aspect we talked about earlier. And then finally, um, there's a uh, too bad article out there just on power supply design, and it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. So those last three, a little more technical in depth, but worth worth the read if you can follow. Even if you just pick up little bits and pieces from it, it's it's worth the read. So where does all that leave us? Okay, a couple things. One, good things come to those that wait. I do think it'll be a few more months. Um, I've got to get these transformers in here. I've got to bench test them. Then I got to go back and do the chassis design again to match up with them, assuming they work out. If not, I'll end up doing something different. Um, got to get these chassis produced. Um, then I got to make the videos. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking this is a 
more of a winter time thing for this year uh, before you guys will start seeing the next videos in the series. But hopefully I've shown you enough to today, let you know I'm serious about this and it, and it is coming. Um, you know, I got to get it right. Um, the, there again, the power supplies everything to this. I got to do the lab testing. Tweaks are imminent and likely going to be required. Um, and then there's the practical element of I got to build it myself, you know, and I got to make sure all these parts are available. Even like one of the last builds I did, I used some resistors in it that I got from Parts Connection. And then by the time I made the videos, they were out of half the values and you couldn't even, um, you couldn't even get those types of resistors. So people, I, I got, I got many, many emails saying I can't find these resistor types. Can you recommend another brand? And so I'm, I'm trying to use stuff that's readily available that you guys can buy without spending a fortune. But same thing. I also want to buy transformers that have both U.S. and European um, input into them. You know, when I did the KT88, I, I used a 110 power transformer from Edcore. I can't tell you how many emails I got from people saying, hey, I'm in the UK, hey, I'm in Australia, what transformer do I use? And then even on top of that, a bigger problem I ran into with Edcore, and why I will not use them again in any more of my builds, is, you know, I had an email this week about the KT88. The guy said, hey, it's uh, it's $280 worth of transformers from Edcore, but they want $510 in shipping to get them to me. I'm not going to play that game. The good thing about the ISO transformers, they have resellers all around the globe. So you would be able to find a reseller in the UK. You'd be able to find a reseller in, in Australia. You'd be able to find a reseller in the US. No matter where you're at, um, you know, you'd be able to do that. And the transformer I spec out is going to have both 110 and, you know, 220 um, type input, 240 type input windings. So, um I think that's important, you know, and then um, we got to lay it all out, build it, whatnot. So I'm just asking you guys, please be patient. Stay tuned. We will get this thing across the line and it will it will be a lot of fun with all that. You know, this is the spirit we're chasing. This is what this thing may have looked like in the movie theater <laughs> decades ago. This is what a pair would look like here today. And like I mentioned, um, worth a small fortune. Um, you know, I follow this kind of stuff on eBay and I have since, I don't know, 20 plus years, since probably 97. I mean, just a handful of these have rolled across to eBay in all the years I've been watching it, 20 some years. So um, it's not stuff you run around. And the beauty of this design and what I think is so great about this, you know, Western Electric is back to making the 300B tube. They're in the final stages of testing. If you're not following them, go to westernelectric.com, look up their 300B, get on their mailing list. They'll send you updates about them. And a pair of these is going to be somewhat affordable. It's all relative, right? But, um, you know, it, it's just going to lead, lead itself to hopefully something that people will be proud of. And, and we'll make beautiful music and um, they'll have learned something and uh, this whole project will be worth doing. So stay tuned, everyone. Sorry for the long uh, 50 minute long video here, but I had a lot to cover and it's been a while. Um, you know, feel free to post down below. Give me your thoughts and input. And uh, we're going to keep going down this journey and get this thing across the finish line later this year and uh, into early next year. Thanks, everyone.